Hello everyone, Ross from 2023, the future here, unless, well, unless you're listening to this in 2024, in which case this is Ross from the past. How thematic, it being Christmas and all. Anyway, um, this episode was recorded way b- back in the past, like 2021, so there's lots of references to COVID and booster jabs and all that, so please enjoy this little time capsule, and also um, this is for more, maybe slightly more mature audiences than our general YouTube videos. Um, so if you have kids in the room, um, just be aware that we will talk about slightly more mature topics. So might be one to skip. Anyway, please enjoy Sir Gowen and the Green Knight. Welcome to Tome Raiders, the podcast where we take folklore and mythology and show up at its court unannounced and command it plays a Christmas game. Um, <laughs> I'm Ross and... I'm Laura. And uh, today we have a very Christmassy episode for you. Um, Coming live from our bed because we both got our co- our COVID booster jabs yes. and are absolutely wiped. We are wiped. <laughs> <laughs> and we were supposed to do this yesterday, but both of us were like... Every joint aches. <laughs> <laughs> but it's better than getting COVID. It's so way better than getting COVID. Get your jabs, kids. Absolutely. And wear your mask and don't touch anything. This Christmas message brought to you by <laughs> the Omicron variant. <laughs> so today, um, as I promised, it's a very Christmassy episode, which, um, I mean, you can still listen to it when it's not Christmas because, you know, this story it's a, it's a free planet. It's like Die Hard. Die Hard's not exclusively a Christmas film, but it is festive to watch it at Christmas. Yes. Um, and likewise, you know, very similar to Die Hard is the plot of Sir Gawain or Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Uh, okay. Very similar. Okay. This is slightly different to our two previous episodes in that I actually do know this story. Yes. Uh, so there won't be such an element of surprise. Yes. Um. Because I've read parts of it and also seen the very good film adaptation starring Dev Patel, which yes. came out recently. Very, very good. Very, very good. Very, very good. And we saw that, what, back in October? Maybe? Something like that. In September? Anyway. Should have brought it out at Christmas. Yeah. It would have, well, to be honest, they should have brought it out like three months earlier. It was it was supposed to be out like way earlier. But then it was really delayed in the UK, which was really irritating. I know, I've, still, I've still got a bee in my bonnet about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, um, and I'm going to say Gawain because I like that pronunciation, um, the one they use in the film, and I believe that both are valid. Did you know that Gawain is the ancient version of Gavin? I didn't. <laughs> Sir Gavin and the Green Knight. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like sounds like a pub, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I would drink that. <laughs> Gavin goes down to the Green Knight, gets a point. Oh my goodness. Yeah, anyway. Um, so this is a... 14th century uh, poem and um, there have been various different translations including a very famous one by Tolkien and another very famous one by Simon Armitage. Um, neither of those are the one we're reading today because neither of them are in the public domain. <laughs> um, so I have the Western translation which was done by uh, Jesse L. Weston, Jesse Ledley Weston, who um, lived in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and um, this is the prose edition rather than the poem edition because I am not a good, a good orator uh, uh, of poems. Uh, I'm sure it'd be fine, but I think it's easier to, tr- to understand the story um, if you're reading the prose version. And to be honest, we want, to, we want you to understand the story. Yes, because so. it is, I cannot emphasise this enough, Bat <laughs> Not quite as bad as Kul- Kul- Kilhook and Olwyn. Well, no. There's no salmon with arms. No salmon with arms. But, <laughs> but Wait and see. <laughs> but, yes. So, we kick off our story um, by recapping a little bit about ancient Britain. Um, and it's kind of just a little introduction. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Okay. Are you ready, darling? I was born ready. Okay. Um And I'm going to skip the first bit because it's not relevant. I'm going to go straight over to the bit where it comes into Brutus. Remember Brutus? And Felix Brutus sailed far over the French flood, which I assume is the 
the channel. I don't know why that's... I'm... Anyway, the French flood, and founded the Kingdom of Britain, mm-hmm. wherein have been war and waste and wonder, and bliss and bale oft time since. I mean, sounds correct. Yeah, it's very accurate. <laughs> and in that Kingdom of Britain have been wrought more gallant deeds than in any other. But of all British kings, Arthur was the most valiant, as I have heard tell. Therefore will I set forth a wondrous adventure that fell out in his time. I like that, the idea that a tale fell out. Mm. Yeah. Fell out of what? I don't know, just fell out of history. Like, history was giving a little shake, and this tale kind of, like, you know, just landed in our laps. So if you're, like, you're sieving for gold. Sieving for gold. This is the little nugget of goodness uh, that you find. Well, well actually, no, this is, the, this is the silt that falls through the... <laughs> <laughs> through the balls. <laughs> oh god <laughs> and if ye will listen to me but for a little while I will tell it even as it stands in story stiff and strong fixed in the letter as it hath long been known in the land King Arthur lay at Camelot upon a Christmas tide with many a gallant lord and lovely lady and all the noble brotherhood of the round table there they held rich revels and gay talk and jest one while they would ride forth to joust and tourney or tawny by the way and again back to the court to make carols. For there was the feast hold in fifteen days, with all the mirth that men could devise, song and glee, glorious to hear. Sounds like our Christmas dinner, doesn't mm-hmm. it? In the daytime and dancing in the night, halls and chambers were crowded with noble guests, the bravest of knights and the loveliest of ladies. And Arthur himself was the comeliest king that ever held a court. For all this fair folk were in their youth, the fairest and most fortunate under heaven, and the king himself of such fame that it were hard now to to name so valiant a hero. So, I've set this up as a Christmas story, but really this is more of a New Year's story because it actually occurs after the New Year had but newly come in. Oh. Yeah, I know. And they had a double portion, apparently, on the high table. It was a, you know, a glut in the New Year, huh. apparently. Um, and they're all just having their merriment and all of that. And, you know, it says, Thus the king sat before the high tables and spake of many things. And there good Sir Gawain was greeted by Guinevere the queen. And on, on her other side sat Agravain, a la dure man. A la dure ma, ma? Anyway. Both were the king's sister's sons and full gallant knights. Then they bear the first course with the blast of trumpets and the waving of banners. Again, what we're going to That's have. That's exactly later. what we're going to yeah. do. Yep. Yeah. Did we sound- mention that it's actually Christmas morning actually as we're Christmas recording morning. this? Yeah. But thankfully, I've been super prepared and made everything in advance and it's all in the freezer, ready to just be chucked in the oven. They didn't have freezers in those times. They had to make was, this on the spot. It was just cold. Just cold. Yeah, they, just- <laughs> <laughs> they just left it outside. Left it outside. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting off the foxes. Yeah. That will come later. Oh, God. Um, with- <laughs> um, anyway, many a heart was upli- uplifted by the melody, I should add. Okay. Yeah. Now I will say no more of the service. Also, I just like the fact that this is narrated from a first-person point of view. Like, this person is is including themselves in the story. Is this... What did you... Who did you say this translation was by? This is the, the Western translation. So you, it was Lady Western. Is she placing herself... She's in, inserting herself into the story? Well, possibly. Like I, Tom Hanks in Forrest Gump. I wonder whether... <laughs> is it all a lie? Tom <laughs> Hanks in Forrest Gump? Is he just inserting himself in American history? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. My sorry. mom always said life is like a box of... Ch-. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I just like this. That I, that, 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 that they talk, well, I don't know whether it was the original, whether the 14th century poem was from this first person narrative. I reckon it probably was. But anyway. Now I will say no more of the service, but that ye may know there was no lack for there drew near a venture that the folk might well have left their labour to gaze upon. As the sound of music ceased, and the first course had been fitly served, there came in at the hall hall door one terrible to behold, of stature greater than any on earth, from neck to loin so strong and thickly made, and with limbs so long and so great that he seemed even as a giant. Well... Pause for laughter. (laughs) (laughs) How far are we in? Already two dick jokes. (laughs) Again. Again. Dad, if you're listening, (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And yet he was but a man, only the mightiest that might mount a steed, broad of chest and shoulders and slender of waist. Hourglass figure. 
and all his features were of like fashion, that men marvelled much at his colour, for he rode even as a knight, yet was green. For he was clad all in green, with a straight coat and a mantle above. All decked and lined with fur was the cloth and the hood that was thrown back from his locks and lay on his shoulders. Hose had he of the same green, and spurs of bright gold with silken fastenings richly worked, and all his vesture was verily green. We get the idea. This is very beautifully written, I have to say. Yeah. It's very evocative. It's very evocative. I think, honestly, this really changed my mind about 14th century literature. Mm. This. I was like, I mean, I mean, it's been modernised for the 19th, 19th century, but still, the, the source material to be this richly detailed is... Quite, well, well, I was going to say it's quite extraordinary, but it's probably Maybe actually not. not that extraordinary. No. We've just got this warped perception of the past in yeah. our minds. So if you hadn't guessed by now, this is the Green Knight making his entrance unannounced during Arthur's dinner. So, yeah. Even the steed on which he rode. Yes, he rode into the hall, ladies and gentlemen and <laughs> non binary folks. Even the steed on which he rode was of the same hue. A green horse, great and strong and hard to hold with broidered bridle. Meat for the rider. Meat? As in, I guess, uh, I don't know. I'm going to let you make your own joke there, folks. Meet M-E-E-T. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I, I, can't, I can't move on without mentioning his beard. On his breast hung a beard. What? <laughs> I'm assuming that it's actually just the beard is hanging from his face, hanging over his breast. <laughs> <laughs> but it's as thick and green as a bush. Well. Yes. So anyway, this guy strides up we on his horse. We should paint your beard green. Oh, that's, 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 you know what? No. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea, but no. Um, <laughs> this description continues for quite a while. It, it keeps going on. The knight bore no helm nor hauberk. Hauberk? Hauberk? Mm-hmm. I don't know how you pronounce that word. I looked up how to pronounce the next word. Neither gorget nor breastplate. Horburg. Horburg. I would go with. I've seen it written, but I've never heard it pronounced. So neither he, he wasn't wearing any, any armor, basically. Um, and Was he, he wearing wa- anything? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, we've covered his beautiful we, gilded. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, in in one hand, he had a holly bough, which is that is greenest when the groves are bare, and in his other, an axe, huge and uncomely, a cruel weapon in fashion, if one would picture it. The knight rideth through the entrance of the hall, driving straight to the high dais, and greeted no man, but looked ever upwards. And the first words he spake were, Where is the ruler of this folk? I would gladly look upon that hero and have speech with him. He cast his eyes on the knights, and mustered them up and down, striving ever to see who of them was of most renown. I mean, at this point, I would be putting my headphones in and pretending to be asleep. <laughs> Just like on the bus. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't talk to me. <laughs> Why have you sat next to me? <laughs> so the Green Knight um, kind of uh, walks into, strides into the hall. And um, Arthur, he's a good, he's a good host. So you know, he get he he uh, does the following. Then Arthur beheld this adventurer before his high dais, and nightly he greeted him, for fearful was he never. <laughs> Sir, he said, thou art welcome to this place, lord of this hall, am I, and men call me Arthur. Light thee down and tarry a while, and what thy will is, that shall be then after. Nay, <laughs> quoth the stranger. I thought that was the horse. <laughs> Nay, quoth the stranger's horse. <laughs> Lest we forget, he is still on a horse inside. Still on a horse. Which to me seems like a total breach of decorum. Absolutely. But... He does get down eventually, you'll be pleased to know. Okay, good. Um anyway, they have a little back and forth. Um Arthur's like, if you're you know, if are you if you want battle, you're gonna you'll find it here, brother. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> do you know who I am? Do we know who I am? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I don't know. It just came unbidden from my mouth. <laughs> um, 
Nay, I ask no fight. In faith here on the benches are but beardless children. Oh. Were I clad in armour on my steed, there is no man here might match me. Therefore I ask in this court but a Christmas jest. For that is, it is Yuletide and New Year, and there are here many fain for sport. If any one in this hall holds himself so hardy, so bold both of blood and brain as to dare strike me one stroke for another, I will give him as a gift this axe, which is heavy enough in sooth to handle as he may list, and I will abide the first blow unarmed as I sit. Seems like a trick. It does seem like a trick, doesn't it? <laughs> then shalt thou give me the right to deal him another, the respite of a year and a day shall he have. Now haste! And let's see whether any here dare say aught. So to recap, what is it that this Green Knight is suggesting? He is basically saying, I, here's my axe. Have a chop at have me. Have a chop at me. And in a year and, and a, a day. day, I'll get to do the same blow back at you. See, the clever thing to do would just be like, give him a little, just a little, little slap. They'll slap what with the butt of the axe. Yeah, just kind of give him a. They'll knock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Loser. <laughs> now I got your axe. <laughs> hey. Uh, but I guess. Um, that's not in the sh- that's not in the chivalric spirit, I mm. suppose. So Arthur is uh, is is the one who uh, who first responds. Uh, uh, but before that. Um, the reason why Arthur responds is because the Green Knight gets all kind of haughty. He goes, well, he frowned and twisted his beard, waiting to see who should rise. And when none answered, he cried aloud in mockery. <laughs> what? Is this Arthur's hall and these the knights whose renown hath run through many realms? And they will put their headphones in and are yeah. pretending to be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Where are now your pride and your conquests, your wrath and anger and mighty words? It's like when um, you know when you're on the tube and one of the <laughs> one of the people the, the god squad come onto the carriage and start preaching at the carriage. I have that. And everybody just kind of looks pointedly at their own feet. Yes. And refuses to make eye contact. Yes. No, I I will uh, I will continue to listen to my podcast and pretend that you don't exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> With that, he laughed so loudly that the blood rushed to the king's fair face for very shame. He waxed wroth, as did all his knights, and sprang to his feet, and drew near to the stranger, and said, Now by heaven foolish is thy asking, and thy folly shall find its fitting answer. That's not in the film. No. In well, the film, he's ever so polite. He is. He is very polite in the film, isn't he? Yeah. I know mo- no man aghast at thy great words. Give me here thine axe, and I shall grant thee the boon thou hast asked. And so Arthur goes up and is like, hey, I will do this. That's but, not in the film either. Is it not? I can't remember now. I don't think so. We should have watched this before doing this podcast, shouldn't we? We have seen it. Well, we have seen it. And it's we have read this ago. book before. Yeah, many times, actually. <laughs> in fact, I've read this book three times in the last two days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before Arthur can strike the blow. Then Gowan, who sat by the queen, leaned forward to the king and spake, I beseech ye, my lord, let this venture be mine. For I think it not seen thee when such challenges be made in your hall, that ye yourself should undertake it, while there are many bold knights who sit beside ye. I am the weakest, I wot, and the feeblest of wit, and it will be the less loss of my life if ye seek sooth. Aww, so, poor so, Gavin. Poor Gavin. <laughs> Gavin needs some self-esteem, yeah. yeah? Aww. I mean, in this point in the story, like... um. In previous Arthurian tales, he'd, for whatever reason, I can't remember the context now, but he killed a lady, chopped off her head and hung it around his neck and showed up at Arthur's court. What? That was quite weird. What? I didn't know that. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, he's not in like, if in contextually, at this point in time, he's not really like in good, in everyone's good graces. Wow. Yeah. He's that weirdo that killed a woman and wore her head like a necklace. <laughs> He's that guy. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, goodness me. Gawain is coming. Everybody look busy. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing that head again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Anyway, carry on. The king loosed his hold of it and lifted up his hand and gave him his blessing and bade him be strong both of heart and hand. 
Keep thee well, nephew, quoth Arthur, that thou give him but the one blow. And if thou readest him rightly, I trow thou shalt well abide the stroke that he may give thee after. Which I think... The stroke he'll give him after, <laughs> hey? <laughs> is everywhere. Um, sorry, I, sorry. That there's more homoeroticism coming later. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I think um, I think that Arthur is probably actually saying to go on, you know. Do you reckon? That's little, not just give my... Give him a little one. <laughs> oh. Just give him a little one, you know. Ah. No, 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 you're... you're I, I saw where you're going. Not that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Gawain approaches the Green Knight and uh, the pair of them, they, uh, well, first the Green Knight asks Gawain his name and all of that. Um, and then Gawain, before he strikes the blow, um, says, where shall I seek thee? Where is thy place? So basically, you know, he wants to, he wants to, to know this stuff beforehand. Mm, it's always uh, good. And suspiciously, the Green Knight, who is about to have his head chopped off, says, that is enough in the new year, it needs no more, quoth the Green Knight to the Gawain. If I told thee truly when I have taken the blow, and thou hast smitten me, then will I teach thee of my house and home. What? And mine own name, then mayest thou like, ask thy road and keep covenant. Hang on, so he's like, chop my head off first and then I'll tell you. Yeah, basically. Surely that should have been a, a warning. Yeah, you'd think that Gawain would be you'd like... You'd think that he'd be like... Yeah, right, whatever. What? <laughs> yeah absolutely so well Gawain takes the axe and i quite like this description i think it's really vivid in this in this in this rendering it kind of it's it reminds me i mean i will say that all of this reminds me of reading like uh, uh like tolkien's uh stuff like the stuff that isn't lord of the rings like silmarillion and all that it reminds me of christopher lee reading children of hurin actually it just has this kind of the word usage is so kind of archaic, but at the same time, kind of weighty, hefty mm, stuff. So anyway. You can feel it. I'll continue. Gowen gripped his axe and raised it on high. The left foot he set forward on the floor and let the blow fall lightly on the bare neck. The sharp edge of the blade sundered the bones, smote through the neck and clave it in two, so that the edge of the steel bit on the ground and the fair head fell to the earth that many struck it with their feet as it rolled forth. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> That's not in the film. <laughs> no, they played football with it. Oh my God. <laughs> the blood spurted forth and glistened on the green raiment, but the knight neither faltered nor fell. He started forward with outstretched hand and caught the head <sighs> and lifted it up. Then he turned to his steed and took hold of the bride. What? <laughs> set his foot in the stirrup and mounted. His head he held by the hair. This is so spooky. It's so spooky. I love it. It's so good. Then he seated himself in his saddle as if naught ailed him, and he were not headless. He turned his steed about, the grim corpse bleeding freely the while, and they who looked upon him doubted them much for the covenant. Would you not just assume you were having an acid trip? Like, if you saw this in front of you, would you not just be like, those mushrooms tasted a bit weird? Yeah. Well, doesn't he eat mushrooms in the film as well? Yeah. Give him a proper acid trip. That doesn't happen in the book, unfortunately. No. But I like the, I like the way the book implies that a lot of this is sort of like a fever dream. Yeah. Not the book, the film. Yeah. Which way around am I saying? Did I say it the wrong way around? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, in the film. So, the Green Knight says, Come now, I charge thee to the Green Chapel. Such a stroke as thou hast dealt, thou hast deserved, and it shall be promptly paid thee on New Year's morn. He's like a flipping idiot, Gawain. Yeah. If he knows that he's going to, like, clearly this is a creepy weirdo who's green all over. Yeah. Clearly there's some kind of magic going on here. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, whatever blow you deal me, I get to do to you in a year's time. And by the way, I'm not going to tell you where I live until after you've chopped my head off. You think you be you think. Hang on, maybe I won't actually kill him. You know what? Maybe I won't respond to this email. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like maybe a pretty. Maybe the IRS don't actually have a three million pound rebate to give me. No, in a year's year and day hence. Exactly. 
<laughs> well, the IRS definitely are giving you giving you a three million pounds rebate. No. <laughs> HMRC then. <laughs> HMRC. <laughs> this one's for our international listeners. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, he turned his bridle and galloped out at the hall door, his head in his hands, so that the sparks flew from beneath his horse's hooves. Oh, so evocative, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You can really, I can see that in my mind's eye. I don't know about you, listeners. Well, enjoy it again. They, anyway, we'll come to that, back to that. Whither he went, none knew, no more than they wist whence he had come. And the king and Gowan, they gazed and laughed, as you do, you know. He's like, ha ha, I'm f***. (laughs) (laughs) In sooth, this had proved a greater marvel than any they had known aforetime. So, like, that weird reaction. Yeah. (laughs) Lol. Also not in the film. In the film, Dev Patel's like, yeah. oh, shit. Yeah, they're like, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Bad times. Um, so they they have a, you know, a very merry kind of time for the rest of Christmas. And then a year passes. I, I thought um, some of this description of the year is quite good, but I don't know. Should I read all of this? I'll read all of this. For Yule was now overpassed and the year after. Each season in its turn following the other. But after Christmas comes Crabbed Lent, that will have fish for flesh and simple cheer. But then the weather of the world chides with winter, the cold withdraws itself, the clouds uplift, and the rain falls in warm showers on the fair plains. So beautiful. Then the flowers come forth, meadows and grove are clad in green. The birds make ready to build and sing sweetly for solace of the soft summer that follows thereafter. The blossoms bud and blow in the hedgerows rich and rank, and noble notes enough are heard in the fair woods. After the season of summer with the soft winds, when Zephyr breathes slightly on seeds and herbs, joyous indeed is the growth that waxes thereout when the dew drips from the leaves beneath the blissful glance of the bright sun. But then comes harvest and hardens the grain, warning it to wax ripe ere the winter. The drought drives the dust on high, flying over the face of the land. The angry wind of the welkin wrestles with the sun. The leaves fall from the trees and light upon the ground, and all brown are the groves that but now were green, and ripe is the fruit that once was flower. So the year passes into many yesterdays, and winter comes again, as it needs no sage to tell us. That is so beautiful. Isn't it incredible? Honestly, when you consider Colwick and Alwyn... Yeah. Which... Admittedly, that's an oral history that has been written down over the years, whereas yeah. this was a poem in it originally. Only two centuries afterwards as well. Yeah. yeah. So obviously it's coming from a different place, a different literary standpoint, mm-hmm. but it's just so beautiful mm. and so evocative. And it's, it's, it's making you call on all of your senses. Mm. You can smell the flowers, you can hear the birds... Absolutely. It's just as- as astonishingly good. It's so good. Um, so Gowan stays until All Hallows Day. A.K.A. The day after Halloween, I guess. Is it not the day before? Halloween, Hall- Hallows, All Hallows Eve. Ah. I think. And this is something else. I haven't looked it up. <laughs> <laughs> he lingered with Arthur and on that day they made a great feast for the hero's sake with much revel and richness of the round table. Courteous knights and comely ladies, all were in sorrow for the love of that night, and though they spake no word of it, many were joyless for his sake. It's quite kind of grim, isn't it? Like, mm. the, he's, he's like sending off this knight to die, basically. Now, I think that's quite, I don't know, it seems quite sombre and quite, again, it's all very evocative. Yeah. Tugs uh, on your heartstrings. Yeah. Poor, poor Sir Gavin. Poor Sir Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> now um they all you know all the all the knights come and give him a slap on the back and and go like you got this mate and uh and so go and has he spent the whole year just getting absolutely jacked I, I, I don't know possibly i mean it does describe him in very sort of like grandiose style when he's leaving but it doesn't i'll get to that in a second but one thing that one recurring theme with Sir Gowan in this is like basically this guy loves his mass. Mm. He is like 
pious as hell. Give me, give me some of that mass. <laughs> I am going every morning, basically. <laughs> He's like, I ain't missing a day. Please, please don't <laughs> let him not, not cut my head off. Yeah, well, yes, that is part of it. Yeah. Yeah, so he's pious, but also, I guess, afraid. Yeah. And so he beseeches the Virgin Mary a lot, which also I find quite interesting because, of course, this was written when England was still Catholic. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of, I guess, for us, for us English people, it's very easy to sort of, like, think of our history as Protestant. Mm. Um, but then if you go back just a little bit further, you, you see all the Catholic memes and... Yeah. <laughs> what <laughs> memes you, in the yeah, in, in the original sense in, rather than the internet sense yes okay yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway um so he he goes to mass and then he get, you know gets all his armor on and uh and it has a very large and grandiose description of his armor sort of similar to the one that Killhook got in okay in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um anyway I, I said this would come back later he smote his he smote the steed with his spurs and sprang on his way so that sparks flew from the stones after him oh this is a recurring theme i expect that the author of the original poem thought hmm, that's very good i I'm like gonna, that one i'm gonna use that again i'll reuse that <laughs> <laughs> i mean we've we've all done it we've all done it <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that was good. Copy paste. Um, <laughs> so, so Gowen goes on his little journey, um, and it seems like Camelot is in Wales because he goes sort of up through Wales and then out into the Midlands. Mm-hmm. Oh God! I know, right? Um, so often he lay companionless at night, and must lack the fare that he liked. No comrade had he save his steed, and none save God with whom to take counsel. And ever he asked that he fared of all whom he met if they had heard any tidings of a green knight in the country thereabouts, or of a green chapel. And all answered him, Nay. They were all horses. <laughs> Never in their lives had they seen any man of such a hue. <laughs> I mean, all there is... <laughs> all these horses... <laughs> Nay. <laughs> Readers, he just Made shook up. his head like a horse. Yeah. And went, <laughs> <laughs> Not readers, I've done it again. Listeners. Listeners. Yeah. All right, so now we talk a little bit of uh, of uh, Gowen's journey. And in the film, this is a lot more is made of this journey. I think there's a lot left sort of untold here. It's only a paragraph, but it's, uh, it's quite a good one. So I'm going to tell it. Mm-hmm. Many a cliff did he climb in that unknown land, where afar from his friends he rode as a stranger. Never did he come to a stream or a ford, but he found a foe before him. And that one so marvellous, so foul and fell, that it behoved him to fight. So many wonders did that knight behold, that it were too long to tell the tenth part of them. Bit of a lazy literature trope. Yeah. Sometimes he fought with dragons and wolves. What? Dragons? Dragons. I didn't know. Right. I've missed that bit in my previous readings. Yep. (laughs) <laughs> Sometimes with wild men that dwelt in the rocks. Another while with bulls and bears and wild boars or with I mean, giant This happens to all of us when we go to the to go to the Midlands. <laughs> <laughs> Get north of Birmingham and all hell breaks. Those loose. wild men in the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> He's clearly approaching Huddersfield. Yeah. <laughs> Had he not been a doughty knight, enduring in a well-proved valour, and a servant of God, doubtless he had been slain, for he was often in danger of death. Yet he cared not so much for the strife. What he deemed worse was when the cold, clear water was shed from the clouds and froze ere it fell on the fallow ground. More nights than enough he slept in his harness on the bare rocks, near slain with the sleet, while the stream leapt bubbling from the crest of the hills and hung in hard icicles over his head. I like that. That mm. like you know, that it's it says a lot about Britain, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like dragons, bulls, bears, whatever. But the rain. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. Thus, in peril and pain and many a hardship, the knight rode alone till Christmas Eve, and in that tide he made his prayer to the Blessed Virgin that she would guide his steps and lead him to some dwelling. Don't, I was like all the robbers and wild men in the stones. Just chill. Yeah, it's, it was raining. It was raining. <laughs> the <laughs> real feel was like minus six. Oh you know? no, the wind chill was the, really yeah. wreaking havoc on him. Absolutely. Yeah, it was bad. Poor Gawain. Yeah. 
Um, so um, he beseeches the Virgin Mary mm-hmm. for like, please give me some place to, you know, hunker down. Now that night had crossed himself but thrice ere he was aware in the wood of a dwelling within a moat. Are you crossing yourself, you know, like doing the sign of the Yeah, yeah, cross. yeah. Um, that comes up a lot, which is why I want to make sure that our listeners are aware of what that means. Um, uh, a dwelling within a moat above a lawn on a mound surrounded by many mighty trees that stood round the moat. Twas the fairest castle that ever a knight owned. Which can't be true because... Didn't they say that about Camelot? They said that about Camelot. They also said that about Isbeth Adam Pencower's castle. That's true. Although, was Isbeth Adam Pencower a knight? Dun, dun, dun. Built in a meadow with a park all about it. And I also like to imagine that the park is like, you know, swings round about. <laughs> <laughs> a little horse that you kind of, you know, the spring on it, you know. Um, anyway, um, clearly, clearly not. Clearly uh, some kind of country park with deer and stuff, right? I mean, this is also Arthurian. So it is possible that I can't pronounce that man's name. Is Bethan Pencow. Is also the owner of this property. Possible, but not. <laughs> because he is not. <laughs> I, I, I did know that. But... <laughs> Maybe Isbeth Adam Pankower is uh, this guy. Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, we're yes. jumping ahead. <laughs> so, so, familiar familiar stuff here. He called aloud and soon there came a porter of kindly countenance who stood on the wall and greeted this knight and asked his errand. Is there a porter? Is there a porter? <laughs> there is <laughs> Good sir <laughs> Quoth Gawain Or Gawain Wilt thou go in mine errands To the high lord of the castle And crave for me lodging Yea by Saint Peter Quoth the porter What? Yeah, I guess Saint Why Peter is the guy like... with the gates right? Ah uh, Like patron saint of porters I guess so <laughs> I see. Okay, that does make sense. The patron, the patron saint of of, uh, of concierge of Gregory Porter. Oh gosh. <laughs> hey Laura, it's me. Anyway, <laughs> in sooth I trow that ye shall be welcome to dwell here so long as it may like ye. Which is interesting. So that clearly the knife isn't in the meat, and no, all that. no, no, clearly yeah, it's uh, all good. All good, the you can come in. In you come. No laws of hospitality, you can just come straight in. No um, need to kill nine gate men. No. <laughs> no, none of that either. No. Um, and nine silent dogs. Um, <laughs> so the this the 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 lord of this castle um, greets Gowan as friends that were fain each embraced the other. And Gowan looked on the knight who greeted him so kindly and thought, "'Twas a bold warrior that owned that burg." Berg? Berg is like another word for castle. Okay. I think it's quite a good word for, for castle. You know, like really. iceberg. I, uh, yeah, I guess it's like an ice castle, isn't it? I love that. Quite cool. I don't know if that's the same etymology. You need to get Susie Dent on here. <laughs> so they He's have... right to something rhymes with purple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they have like a little kind of party, you know, like, a, like they welcome him in. And then someone shows up. Oh. The lady of the castle. And... She has a very strange companion. Shall I read this? Yes. The fairest of ladies was she in face and figure and colouring, fairer even than Guinevere, so the knight thought. She came through the chancel to greet the hero. Another lady held her by the left hand, older than she and seemingly of high estate, with many nobles about her. But unlike to look upon were those ladies, for if the younger were fair, the elder was yellow. What? Yeah, like jaundiced or something. Rich red were the cheeks of the one, rough and wrinkled those of the other. The kerchiefs of the one were broidered with many glistening pearls, her throat and neck bare, and whiter than the snow that lies on the hills. The neck of the other was swathed in a gorget, with a white wimple over her black chin. A black chin? Yeah. Her forehead was wrapped in silk with many folds, worked with knots, so that naught of her was seen save her black brows, her eyes, her nose and her lips. Right. And those were bleared and ill to look upon. A worshipful lady in sooth one might call her. In figure was she short and broad and thickly made. Far fairer to behold was she whom she led by the hand. So. 
the really gone to great lengths to let you know that this girl is kind of minging. Yeah, so you got like the like like the whoa. Yeah. Ten out of ten. Megan Fox. Megan Fox holding someone who has been described rather roughly. Here, yeah. Which I think isn't very fair. Very harsh. Um I think I think the point of this comparison is to draw is to like So you realise how hot how so, hot she is. Yeah. Um but this this, this weird lady uh, does have context that comes later. And if you remember the film it's never explained. It's just this weird lady with like a like a sash over her eyes. Yeah, it's never really explained in the film. The but crone. The crone. Oh, we love a good crone, don't yeah. we? I can't wait to become a crone. I feel like I'm halfway there already. <laughs> How old do you have to be to be a crone? I'm hoping thirty-one because then I've only got a year to go. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get a little crone passport. <laughs> <laughs> I am a crone. You can see it right there. <laughs> <laughs> There was meat, there was mirth, there was much joy, so that to tell thereof would take me too long. O peradventure, I might strive to declare it. So they have a, you know, good time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, and so the, the, the knight of the castle, the lord of the castle, invites Gowen to stay. Dwell here till New Year's Day, and then rise and set forth, and you shall be set in the way. So basically, Gowen tells the um the this this lord um of his quest to the mm-hmm. green chapel mm-hmm. it's sort of like i can't i can't stay here because i gotta go to a chapel and have my head chopped off and the and the lord's like i don't stay here it's only like it's only two miles away he says tis not two miles hence oh that's so, convenient very convenient gosh yeah i know right it's, lucky gawain lucky gawain lucky yeah it's, it's like are we going with garwin or gawain i'm going with gawain Okay, well, I've well, always said Gawain. We're going to go with both. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, he's got an invite to stay over Christmas, which is quite nice. That's very yeah, generous. Very generous. Um, but uh, even more generous, uh, the knight, uh, the, the lord of the castle, um, suggests a, a little uh, agreement. Sir knight, quoth the host, we shall make a covenant. Whatsoever I win in the wood shall be yours. And whatever may fall to your share, that ye shall that shall ye exchange for it. Let us swear, friend, to make this exchange, however our hap may be, for worse or for better. So basically, whatever the whatever the host finds in the woods, um, Sir Gowan has to share whatever he finds in the castle. But it's the host's castle. I know. They love a really weird um, covenant in the in the thirteenth century. They do. Absolutely. <laughs> So night falls and uh, and they, you know, go to sleep and then wake up in the morning and there's a rather long description of the host going hunting. It's quite a good description, but... Um, but brevity will For brevity, I'm just going to keep it short. I'll just cut straight to this bit. So the Lord roamed the woods and Gowan, that good night, they ever abed, curtained about under the co- costly coverlet. Same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we lay ever abed. Under a costly cover. Yeah. This duvet cover was like forty pounds, ladies and gentlemen, we got and from, non-binary folks. What was it? Brand Alley. Brand Alley. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> As he lay half slumbering, he heard a little sound at the door, and he raised his head and caught back a corner of the curtain, and waited to see what it might be. It was the lovely lady, the Lord's wife. It's a trick. It's a trick! <laughs> she shut the door softly behind her and turned towards the bed. And Gowen was shamed, laid him down softly and made as if he was as if he slept. <laughs> it's like he's on the tube. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got his headphones in once again. <laughs> Look anywhere, but just don't make eye contact. <laughs> and she came lightly to the bedside within the curtain and sat herself down beside him to wait till he wakened. My God. Goodness, that is so creepy. The knight lay there a while and marvelled within himself what her coming might betoken. And he said to himself, Twere, twere more seemly if I asked her what hath brought her hither. <laughs> Rather than just pretend to be asleep. <laughs> yeah. Then he made faint to waken and turned Whoa. towards her. <laughs> Good morning, darling. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> and opened his eyes as one astonished. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> and and crossed himself. 
Oh, Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. <laughs> and she looked on him laughing with her cheeks red and white, lovely to behold, <laughs> and small smiling lips. Literally never happened. Literally never happened. You've seen me in the morning. I yeah. wake up with like yesterday's mascara smeared across me. <laughs> <laughs> Hair all sticking up. Yeah. So they bandy words for a little bit. And um, you can tell like, you know, you can tell, you can tell the, this uh, this lady is looking for a little bit extra. Oh. Yeah, you can tell she's sort of uh, coming with. Uh, she wants the D. With designs. The, the D is for designs. Um, <laughs> the D is for dick, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and non-binary folks. Yeah. All right, so then this this is what her what I guess what her her end intent is, um, uh, because basically she's she sort of taunts him a little bit and goes like, "You can't be going," and uh, she says, "But that ye be go- going, my mind misdoubts me greatly." Wherefore, <laughs> quoth the knight quickly. Remember, wherefore means why. Uh, fearing lest he had lacked in some courtesy, and the lady spake. So true a knight as Gawain is holden, and one so perfect in courtesy, would never have tarried so long with a lady, but he would of his courtesy have craved a kiss at parting. Then quoth Gawain, I what I will do even as it may please ye, and kiss at your commandment as a true knight should who forbears to ask for fear of displeasure. At that she came near and bent down and kissed the knight, and each commended the other to Christ. What? <laughs> <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> I commend thee. <laughs> Quoth. <laughs> <laughs> and she went forth from the chamber softly. Of course, softly. And how do you go forth softly? Uh, on tippy toes? I don't know. I don't know. I've never tried. <laughs> <laughs> I've never <laughs> gone forth softly in my life. <laughs> so um, the uh, the host comes back. After a, after a hard hunt, Joel Edgerton. Joel Edgerton comes back, and uh, and gives all of his uh, all of the game he he acquires on the hunt over to Gowen, and uh, and he's like, well, I you know I'm giving this to you. So whatever, what is what 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 are you giving to me? And with that, he clasped his hands round the Lord's neck and kissed him as courteously as he might. <laughs> Take ye here my spoils. No more have I won. You should have it freely, though it were greater than this. So what if she'd sucked him off? Would he have had to suck Joel Edgerton off? Yes. I guess so. But that's why Gowen doesn't want to do it, right? Cause... Not because you shouldn't shag other people's wives. Because he doesn't want to have... Doesn't He doesn't want to have to shag Joel Edgerton. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Possibly. You know, don't knock it till you tried it. I guess. Um, <laughs> Tis good, says the host. <laughs> Grand mercy thereof. Grand mercy. Grand mercy. Big thanks. Grand merci. Grand merci. Thereof. I like that. That's a good word. We should try and use that more often. Yeah. Yet were I fain to know where you won this same favour, favour, and if it were by your own wit. Nay, answered Gawain's horse. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in the bond. Ask you no more. I, I'm not going to kiss and tell. I'm not going to kiss and tell. <laughs> you have taken what is yours by right. Be content with that. They laughed and jested together. He'd be like, <laughs> weird, because <laughs> all the women here are either my family members or my wife. So who have you snogged? <laughs> it's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. It's not in the pond. <laughs> Why does it sound? It just feels like, like, it really does feel like the host is, made, is, is played by Ricky Gervais. It's yeah, like, it does. It's like, <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Good to know that you are. Uh, you snog in somebody in my household. Someone. Someone in my house. Cool. Great. All right. <laughs> so, day two. Um, okay, okay. Basically, this repeats itself three times, as is, as is the rule of three in storytelling. Um, and the, on day two, um, we have a... F- <laughs> Remember Turk Truth? Yes. So, there's another boar. Oh my god! Um, and uh, so, so the host goes and kills a boar, but the boar is like you know, properly strong boar, um, and not uh, a king that's been not cursed king for his cursed. sins. Not that strong. Okay. But but, uh, but yeah, there's a boar, and the boar is um, 
bronze all the way to Cornwall and out into the sea. Yeah. But, but if you actually. haven't listened to our previous episode, you probably should, so you understand yeah. these circular references. Absolutely. <laughs> but when the boar felt the stroke of the arrows, he waxed mad with rage and turned on the hunters and tear many, so that, affrighted, they fled before him. But the lord on a swift steed pursued him, blowing his bugle. <laughs> <laughs> As a gallant knight, he rode through the woodland, chasing the boar till the sun grew low. Animal Hospital theme tune. (laughs) (laughs) He's not blowing a saxophone. (laughs) 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 Okay, we're gonna have to move on before. (laughs) We should have advised skip thirty seconds. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> so did the hunters this day, while Sir Gawain lay in his bed, lapped in rich gear, and the lady forgot not to salute him, for early was she at his side to cheer his mood. So Cheer his mood, eh? Yeah. Is that what the kids are calling it in those days? Mm-hmm. And this time, she kisses him twice. Ooh. And then... And then the knight arose and went forth to mass. Arose, eh? Yeah. At mass, he eh? He rose to... Yeah. <laughs> Went forth to mass. Now, is that what you call it? Dun, dun, dun. Um, so, <laughs> clearly, Gowen's feeling a little bit guilty about this. It is like, is it kind of, this is kind of gross. It's kind of weird. It's a bit it's weird. weird. I'm kissing it like twice, but it's kind of okay. It's kind of a weird kind of chivalric code in the old times. It's sort of like, it's like, you can, you can fall in love with another knight's wife, but you can't do the do. Uh-huh. But you can uh-huh. have like a what like a sort of like a, a non platonic a... but non physical relationship with her in a way. I see. Sort of like. Let me tell you, if you have a non platonic relationship with another knight's wife, I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> and and her. And her. <laughs> <laughs> then they handled the huge head. What? <laughs> Of the boar, and the Lord said aloud, Now, Gowen, this game is your own by sure covenant, as you right well know. Tis sooth, quoth the knight, and as truly will I give ye all I have gained. He took the host round the neck and kissed him courteously twice. Now we are quits, he said, this eventide of all the covenants that we made since I came hither. Enough covenants! Stop! Getting me into covenants is going terribly for me. <laughs> now I've got a f- boar's head. Your girl, your girlfriend won't leave me alone. And I've got to go and get my head chopped off by some green bloke. <laughs> covenants can get in the bin. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> carry on. And the, <laughs> and the Lord answered, By St Giles, you're the best I know. You will be rich in a short space if she if you drive such bargains. I don't really understand. Anyway. Um, so he's like, I'm giving you, like, all this game. Yeah. I'm giving you... I'm, I'm going out into the forest every single day and running down wild animals. Yeah. And what are you giving me? A kiss. Two kisses. Two kisses that you've apparently received from some woman in my household, which consists only of my wife and some old crone. So who are you snogging? The question stands. Yes, it's... Yeah. Maybe he's... He's not asking maybe, the right questions. Maybe he's snogging himself in the mirror, just like practice, you know? Do you do that? I've never done that. <laughs> Therefore, abide you. <laughs> and I will hunt in this wood and hold ye to the covenant to exchange with me against all the spoil I may bring hither. For twice have I tried ye... And found you true, and the morrow and the morrow shall be the third time and the best. So the host is like, tomorrow I'm gonna bring the best game of the three times. And maybe you'll because... suck my dick. <laughs> <laughs> He's really trying, isn't he? <laughs> but his hunt doesn't actually turn out as good. Um, oh no! But we'll get to that in a Poor second. Joel. But for the th- for the third for the third morning, 
the lady of the, of the castle is she goes all out oh god right? she just turns up in a negligee she clad herself in a rich mantle that oh. reached even to the ground <laughs> okay Le- not a negligee then left her throat and her fair neck bare oh and was bordered and lined with costly furs on her head she wore no golden circlet but a network of precious stones that gleamed and shone through their, her tresses in clusters of twenty together thus she came to the chamber closed the door after her and set open a window and called to him gaily so knight how may ye sleep the morning is so fair sir gawain was deep in slumber and in his dream he vexed him much for the destiny that should befall him on the morrow when he should meet the knight at the green chapel and abide his blow but when the lady spake he heard her and he came to himself and roused from his dream and answered swiftly the lady came laughing and kissed him courteously and he welcomed her fittingly with a cheerful countenance. He saw her so gloriously and gaily dressed, so faultless of features and complexion, that it warmed his heart to look upon her. They exchanged fair words, and much happiness was therein. Yet there was a gulf between them, and she might win no more of her knight, for that gallant prince watched well his words. He would neither take her love nor frankly refuse it. Oh, good for him. Yeah. I mean, he he probably the thing is he's trying to be he's trying to be he's 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 trying to be gallant, mm. and so he's trying he doesn't want to have you know he doesn't want to do the do with this with this lady because he's like I'm not going to have a I'm not going to bone this host's wife. Mm. He's but, being so nice to me, but he's also like feeling like you know that he needs to be a good guest. And he's he can't like spurn I her, can't spurn can't spurn you. So you know he comes he's across in a bit quite of a well. Difficult. He's in a, yeah. he's on a sticky wicket. Mm. So um, they kiss a further time, um, uh, and Gowen says, "I'm sorry, but it's not this. This is this is kind of not really working." Mm. So he does actually confront her about it, and and she's sort of a little bit offended. She says, "Now, dear, at our parting, do me this grace: give me some gift, if it were but thy glove, that I may bethink me of my night and lessen my morning." Oh, poor Han. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, um, I think, he, yes, he does give the glove. I can't remember now. Anyway, um, and the lady uh, gives him or goes to give him a ring in return, but Gon refuses it. Um, and after that, uh, because the ring was refused, she says, if you refuse my ring as too costly, that you will not be so highly beholden to me, I will give you my girdle as a lesser gift. With that, she loosened a lace that was fastened at her side, knit upon her kirtle under her mantle. It was wrought of green silk and gold, only braided by the fingers, and that she offered to the knight, and besought him, though it were of little worth, that he would take it. And he said, Nay, he would touch neither gold nor gear, ere God gave him grace to achieve the adventure for which he had come hither. What he should say to her is I've got this covenant with your husband. So anything that you give to me, I have to then give to him. So if I take your girdle, I'm going to have to then give it to your husband and he'll know that you've given me your girdle. And your kisses. And your kisses. (sighs) I mean, that's a a pretty good argument to say... No, thank you. No, thank you. um, To refuse the gifts. Um, But there is a thing about this girdle. Mm. She says... For whatever knight is girded with this green lace, while he bears it knotted about him, there is no man under heaven can overcome him, for he may not be slain for any magic on earth. <laughs> and suddenly he's like, okay, screw you, Joel Edgerton. Yeah. <laughs> I want the magic belt. Yeah, suddenly he's like, yeah, I'll have it. <laughs> but, as we'll see, uh, he wants that magic belt and ain't giving it to no one. Mm-hmm. So um, they kiss again and Gowen goes... And has mass, and I like this description of of uh, of 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 how it goes. The priest assoiled him and set him as clean as if doomsday had been on the morrow. I mean, dot dot dot. <laughs> so um, the night the uh, the host comes back, and um, and go and just go straight to him and says. Now shall I be the first to fulfil our covenant, which we made together when there was no lack of wine. Then he embraced the knight and kissed him thrice as solemnly as he might. How do you kiss someone solemnly? Um, 
without smiling? I guess so, yeah. So the the host is like, whoa, okay. Um, three kisses three from kisses. either my wife or my or the crone. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? Yeah. Um, but the uh, the host, all he has to give him today from the hunt is a fox skin. That's horrible. Yeah. So they only managed to kill a little fox. I mean, that hurts my vegan heart. It does. Yeah, it hurts me too. It's kind of, but. In the film, it the this fox is his sort of companion along the way, isn't it? Kind yeah. of speaking to him. So that's not that's not in the book or in the poem even. Um, but I like that that was added to the film as sort of like a tie in, so that fox kind of feels more significant. Mm. I thought it was quite quite interesting. It's a nice detail. Yeah. So, um, it goes on, and uh, and is since that is the final day before the morrow when Gowen goes to get his head chopped off Mm -hmm. Um, again a little interjection from the from the from the author or from the poet that he slept soundly i may not say for the morrow gave him much to think on let him rest a while for he was near that which he sought and if you will but listen to me i will tell ye how it fared with him thereafter I like that they've just suddenly broken the fourth wall yeah they're suddenly direct like addressing you directly Mm. That's a nice change of pace. Absolutely. Makes it feel a bit like a pantomime, doesn't it? It does a bit. But in a nice way. He's behind you! <laughs> <laughs> I am the Green Knight behind you! <laughs> <laughs> oh no! He... Anyway. <laughs> um, so, so I don't know if you noticed, but Gowen has this girdle mm. and didn't give it. Didn't give it to Joel Edgerton. The girdle of green silk set gaily and well upon the royal red cloth, rich to behold. But the knight wear it not for the pride of the pendants, polished though they were, with fair gold that gleamed brightly on the ends, but to save himself from sword and knife, where it behoved him to abide his hurt without question. So he knows, going into this, like, that he has done something a bit shifty. Mm. And so there is a bit of shame on going and i think that shame is a real kind of uh, uh a theme a huge theme in the film and mm. it definitely is in the, in the in the book in the poem as well so Gowen goes off um with a with a guide and um and they go off to the area near the green chapel and the guide says therefore sir good sir Gowen, let the man be and get ye away some other road for God's sake, seek ye another land, and there may Christ speed ye. And I will hie me home again, and I promise ye further that I will swear by God and the saints, or any other oath ye please, that I will keep counsel faithfully, and never let any wit the tale that ye fled for fear of any man. So he's saying, get out of here. Yeah. And Gawain says, Gramercy. So, it, then it says, it literally says, quoth Gawain, but ill-pleased. So Gowen's like, mm, no. Thanks very much. Thanks, but, but no, thanks. no thanks. Also, the guide in the in the in the adaptation is a fox. Yeah. He's like, run, idiot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The same fox that is killed, I guess, in the Yeah. But but that so the order of events is slightly different in the film, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um The Knight is on his horse, by the way, which I haven't mentioned, is called Green Galay. I love that. The, then the knight spurred Gringolet and rode her down the path close in by the bank beside a grove. So he rode through the rough thicket, right into the dale, and there he halted, for it seemed him wild enough. No sign of a chapel could he see, but high and burnt banks on either side, and rough, rugged crags with great stones above. An ill-looking place, he thought it. Then he saw, as it were, a mound on a level space of land by a bank beside the stream, where it ran swiftly, the water bubbled within as if boiling. I think it's quite, quite evocative. Or quite mm, like that. I love that. The yeah. water bubbled within as if boiling. Yeah. So it's interesting there's a mound. I kind of like imagine it as like, you know, those burial mounds that they did, like the, mm. like the, the kind of Neolithic ones uh, that, that, that they're all over the, over the UK. Yeah. And quite elongated. I don't, I don't suppose it is that because there wasn't, those ba- those mounds didn't actually have an interior. No, but that's the image that it evokes in my in my mind. I love the imagery of the stream. Mm. So uh, we're using the word evocative a lot, but it is. It, it does evoke. It evokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Ah, quoth Gawain, can this be the green chapel? Here might the devil say his matins at midnight. Now I whiz there is wizardry here. Tis an ugly oratory, all overgrown with grass, and twould well beseem that fellow in green to say his devotions on devil's wise. Now feel I in five wits, tis the foul fiend himself who hath set me in this tryst to destroy me here. This is a chapel of mischance. Ill luck betide it, tis the cursedest kirk that ever I came in. It's really very, very beautifully written. It really is. So he's saying, like, clearly this is the devil's schemes at work here. Yeah, you know, he's, yeah. He's like, this something is odd here. Um. So here comes the Green Knight. Then he came forth from a cave in the crag with a fell weapon, a Danish axe newly dight, wherewith to deal the blow. An evil head it had, four feet large, no less, sharply ground, and bound to the handle by the lace that gleamed brightly. And the knight himself was all green as before, face and foot, locks and beard, but now he was afoot. When he came to the water he would not wade it, but sprang over with the pole of his axe, and strode boldly over the brent that was white with snow. And basically, I'll just continue reading this bit, because this is, this is like the end of the story in a yeah. way. So, I'm just going to keep going. So Gowen went to meet him, but he made no low bow. Rude. He, the other said, Now, fair sir, one may trust thee to keep tryst. Thou art welcome, Gowen, to my place. Thou hast timed thy coming as befits a true man. Thou knowest the covenant said between us. At this time twelve months agone, thou didst take that which fell to thee, and I at this new year will readily requite thee. Can I check? Does his, is his head reattached at this point? I assume so. How has he done that? Magic. Okay. No further questions. <laughs> we are in this valley very alone. Here are no knights to sever us, do what we will. Have off thy helm from thine head, and have here thy pay. Make me no more talking than I did when thou didst strike off my head with one blow. <laughs> Sit down, shut up. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> Nay, quoth Gawain. It's horse. <laughs> <laughs> By God that gave me life, I shall make no moan whatever befall me. But make thou ready for the blow, and I shall stand still and say never a word to thee, do as thou wilt. With that he bent his head, and showed his neck all bare, and made as if he had no fear that he would not be the thought a dread. That's an awful lot of words for him to say, okay, I'll shut up. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll be quiet, but I'm going to keep talking to say I'll be quiet. <laughs> right. Then the green knight made him ready, and grasped his grim weapon to smite Gowen. With all his force he bore it aloft with a mighty feint of slaying him. Had it fallen as straight as he aimed, he who was ever doughty of deed had been slain by the blow. But Gowen swerved aside as the axe came gliding down to slay him as he stood, and shrank a little with the shoulders for the sharp iron. The other heaved up the blade and rebuked the prince with many proud words. <laughs> proud words. He cussed him out. Yeah. Thou art not Gowen, he said. Who was held so valiant that ever feared he the man by hill or vale? But thou shrinkest for fear ere thou feelest hurt. Such cowardice did I never hear of Gawain. Neither did I flinch from thy blow or make strife in King Arthur's hall. My head fell to my feet, and yet I fled not. But thou didst wax faint of heart ere any harm befell. Wherefore must I be deemed the braver knight? So basically going, you are a wimp, sir. <laughs> yeah, basically. Sit still. I love it. I thought you were supposed to be Garwin. Yeah. Who the hell are you? Garwin wouldn't run away. No, not the Gavin I know. No. <laughs> Quoth Garwin, I shrank once, but so will I no more. Though and my head fall on the stones, I cannot replace it. But haste, sir knight, by thy faith, and bring me to the point. Deal me my destiny and do it out of hand. For I will stand thee a stroke and move no more till thine axe have hit me, my troth on it. Have at thee then, quoth the other, and heaved aloft the axe with fierce mien, as if he were mad. He struck at him fiercely, but wounded him not, withholding his hand ere it might strike him. Go what? Hang on, what? Yeah. 
So he's he 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 does a he does a little uh, like psych. A- Psych! Yeah. <laughs> Go in a bow the stroke and flinch in no limb, but stood still as a stone or the stump of a tree that is fast rooted in the rocky ground with a hundred roots. Then spake gaily the man in green. So now thou hast thine heart whole, it behoves me to smite. Hold aside thy hood that Arthur gave thee, and keep thy neck thus bent, lest it cover it again. Then Gowen said angrily, Why talk on thus? <laughs> Thou dost threaten too long. I hope thy heart misgives thee. Can't, what? Shut up! Yeah. Get on with it! Get on with it! Why are you still talking? Forsooth, quoth the other, so fiercely thou speakest, I will no longer let thine errand wait its reward. Then he braced himself to strike, frowning with lips and brow. Twas no marvel that it pleased but ill him who hoped for no rescue. He lifted the axe like thee, and let it fall with the edge of the blade on the bare neck. Though he struck swiftly, it hurt him no more than on the one side, where it severed the skin. The sharp blade cut into the flesh, so that the blood ran over his shoulder to the ground. So he cut his head off? No, just fairly lightly sliced his neck. Hmm. Doesn't happen in the film, does it? No. In the film he goes, right. Off with your head. <laughs> so good. I love the ending of the film. The film ends there. Yeah. And I love that because... There's the, a kind of question mark. Yeah. The tone of the rest, the tone of the rest of the film does not match what is now about to happen. Mm. So Gowen, he like grabs his sword and he's like, don't hit me again with your axe. I, I, you, you've done your thing. You've hit me now. So we are even. Um... But the uh, the Green Knight starts laughing and says in a merry voice, I promise thee a blow and thou hast it. Hold thyself well paid. I release thee of all other claims. Oh, that's nice of him. Yeah. So the Green Knight mm-hmm. is about to say who he is. Mm-hmm. Have you worked it Well, I mean, I've read this before. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, have you worked it out? Listeners, let us know in the comments. What if, comments? This is not a YouTube video. This <laughs> is not a YouTube video. But we do now have a Twitter and yeah. an Instagram. This is not on Twitter if you worked it out. <laughs> the other faint I proffered thee for the morrow. My fair wife kissed thee. Dun, dun, dun. And thou didst give me her kisses. For both those days I gave thee two blows without scathe. True man, true return. But the third time thou didst fail, and therefore hadst thou that blow. For tis my weed now thou wearest. That same woven girdle, my own wife wrought it. That do I what for sooth. Yeah. The Green Knight. The girdle. It was. Is the Green Knight? Is the is the is is, is the Lord? Is the Lord. Absolutely. Now know I well. Like so, he is. knew all along. He knew all along. He's a he's a crafty fox. That uh, yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now know I well thy kisses and thy conversation and the wooing of my wife, for t'was my own doing. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know, mate, though. I mean, she seemed pretty into it. I you know, mean... it's fairly convincing stuff. Also, going to his credit, he was like, hang on, hun. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to snog you. I'll give you a little kiss, but we're not going anything further. No, we are not, not going to befoul this chamber. Exactly. Yeah. So I mentioned before that shame is a key theme in this. Mm. So all the blood flew to his face, i.e. Gowen's face. Uh, and he shrank for shame as the Green Knight spake. And the first words he said were, Cursed be ye, cowardice and covetousness, for in ye is the destruction of virtue. So he gives back the girdle to the Green Knight. And uh, and he he is thoroughly chastised and feels chastised. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. But the Green Knight actually gives it back. He says, And this girdle that is wrought with golden green like my raiment, do I give thee, Sir Gowen, that thou mayest think upon this chance when thou goest forth among princes of renown, and keep this for a token of the adventure of the Green Chapel. So, um, it, it's basically like, you know, that's that's kind of how it, how it kind of tapers out. Um, of course, you know who, you know who Gowen blames in all this? King Arthur? Women. Oh! But tis no marvel if one be made a fool and brought to sorrow by women's wiles. Oh, for 
<laughs> for so was Adam beguiled by one. Oh my god. And Solomon by many. And Samson all too soon, for Delilah dealt him his doom. And David thereafter was wedded with Bathsheba, who, which brought him with <laughs> sorrow. If one might love a woman and believe her not, twere great gain. And since all they were beguiled by women, methinks tis the less blame to me that I was misled. Of course. He didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. It was all the evil women's is. It is. Ugh, men. Yeah, absolutely. Ugh, that's so annoying. I'm so, ugh. It's, 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 it's really cringe, isn't it? Um, the just so you know, it's embarrassing. Yeah. I'm embarrassed for you, Gavin. Yeah, it's that's highly. It it he stops coming across so not so well now, doesn't he? He was coming across so nicely. Yeah. <sighs> so the 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 host. Why uh, why do men? Why do men? Why do men? Why, why do men? Why are men? Why are men? Why are men? Um, the host slash the Green Knight uh, reveals his name, which is Bern Lac de Haute Desert. Sorry. Bern Lac de Haute Desert. Can you spell that, please? Burn Lack, spelt here, is B E R N L A K. Oh, right. So it's more than one word. Yeah. De. Uh, oh, in okay. Burn Lack. Oats Dessert. Okay. Oat Dessert. Oat Dessert. Uh-huh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and he reveals that Morgan the Fay, ah. Arthur's half sister, dwells in the house. The crone. We think. I mean, I read it and I think that means the crone, but then. Like the girdle, it belonged to the wife. So is the girdle, is the wife Morgan the Fay? Maybe it's 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 difficult to tell. I don't think it's made explicitly clear. Um, if you disagree with that, then correct me, please. Um, but anyway, um, yeah. So that's basically what happens. Um, Gowen goes back to Camelot, and um. All the other knights wear a green sash as well, as sort of like a. <laughs> let's remember this story. I'll go and you know you, you know they they uh, they they make a little kind of thing about it. You know it's all oh, wearing green sashes. Guys, shut up. <laughs> so this story ends with a little. I mean, I'm sure this poem is this little kind of stanza is in the final mm. the poem as well. But many a venture here before hath fallen such as this. May he that bear the crown of thorn. Bring us unto his bliss. Amen. 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 That was Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. So what were your thoughts? I think it's really interesting the way that the film producers changed it. Yeah. The ending specifically. Yeah. Um, I think I prefer the, the, the ending in the film. Yeah, me too. Um, it's much more ambiguous. Yeah. And Gawain does not turn out to be a massive boy that blames women for everything. I mean, he does turn out to be a massive boy, but just he doesn't blame women for everything. Mm. And there's no acid trip in the book. Whereas in, yeah. in the film, there's this whole weird section where he sees giants walking around the mountains. Yeah. Also, if you recall, he also has that kind of like fever dream moment where he kind of sees his future as if he ran from the Green Knight. Yeah. And uh, and like his kind of depressing kingdom ending kind of thing, which I thought was... It's a really good... Inc- it's really Really good. powerful. Yeah. It kind of like faces him up against his shame in a way. Yeah. Because the shame is against such a big thing. There's lots of themes to this book that you wouldn't... Like on first reading, you might not necessarily... Uh, catch yeah you think that it's all just knights in shining armor and dragons and you know disappointing lack of dragons only one mention of dragons i, I know dragons. i know but you know what i mean like yeah. you, you think oh, sh- chivalry and knights yeah. and maidens and then you realize actually this is a- about a man's shame yeah and him fighting to prove himself to his uncle and his king yeah um and you know the way that he is manipulated not only by the lord but by his wife Mm -hmm. yeah i'm big fan big fan guys i think it's got it's interesting because it kind of the way that the green knight is described it kind of has like an element of like kind of cosmic horror about it i love that though yeah it's similar to like it reminds you of the grendel from or grendel from beowulf Mm. a kind of like weird seaweed green mm. kind of like what is this creature is because un- you don't see things walk around that are green no 
No. And that's my other thought on this, on this, well, this is the prose version, but on this poem is how beautiful it, beautifully it's written, mm. how evocative some of these passages are. Yeah. You really can see and smell, like you can smell the moss and the mud and yeah. the, you can hear the, the water and you feel, you can almost feel like your, your clothes are damp. Yeah. Well, you said earlier how it engages all your senses. All of your senses. I'm like, oh my God, I feel cold. I feel damp. I can smell the mud clinging to my shoes. Mm. I can feel like the dirt under my nails and like that kind of horrible chilling sense of dread. Mm. That, think, that's we've so all true, been yeah. there. Yeah. Go to any campsite in Britain yeah. and you will feel that cold sense of dread. <laughs> <laughs> Communal showers. Oh! <laughs> no! <laughs> I, I, here's, here's one that I thought was quite interesting. It just ties into that, is like the fact that there is that kind of description of the weather and the way that Gowen's feeling and like... I think that's something if you're writing, you know, mm. when you're when you're doing kind of I think that that sometimes people when they're trying to tell a story almost forget to tell how it feels. Yeah. And and using the senses, engaging the senses kind of grounds you in it. You know who's amazing at that more recently, not recently, but more recently is John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck. This gives yes. me extreme Steinbeck vibes. That's interesting. That's really interesting. I feel like when you read the beginning of um, what which one? Which of mice one? and men is my is the. One I I'm, was thinking of East of Eden. You think of East of Eden? The the beginning passage of East of Eden. Yeah. Oh my god, I'm getting such severe Steinbeck vibes from this. That's really cool. I mean, that's high praise. I mean, yeah. Steinbeck is yeah no absolutely yeah it does it like. Is like the sound of the words. I mean, again, this is, I guess, the quality of the Western translation. I guess it's like mm. the sound of the words actually kind of give that that you know they're doing more heavy lifting than just the descriptions. It's kind of like there is that sibilance and the ah, mm. uh, it's great. It's really great. I think it's fantastic. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed reading along with us. Yeah. If you've enjoyed this, please do let us know. Um, we live for your validation and encouragement. Yes. Because um, we're doing this as you know, as a passion project, but it would be nice to get some get some feedback. We're on everywhere that you will find quality podcasts: Absolutely. Apple Podcasts. Um, we're on Pocket Casts, Spotify, Spotify. Um, where else? We Podbean. Yeah, everywhere that you find good podcasts. If you want to give us a five star review, that would be nice. Um, because that you know feed feed Al Gore. Feed Al Gore. Um, so that we are boosted up onto people's radars. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very. Have a very, very Merry Christmas. Absolutely. And a Happy New Year. May you eat, drink and be merry, whether you're with your family or isolating or whether you have a huge family or like me, it's just the four of you. Have a fantastic Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas, everyone.